In a recent previous video, I talked about the fact that certain cells can accumulate toxins, not just certain, all of our cells can accumulate toxins. And those toxins then can lead to what are called cytopathic effects, meaning the cells themselves start to excrete things like exosomes that can look like viruses or can attract the presence of other microorganisms in order to support tissue cleanup. Uh, I didn't allude to uh, the, the, the specific toxins, and I had a lot of emails asking about what toxins I was referring to. In particular, there are several toxins that have an affinity for the intracellular environment. Um, there's a lot of toxins in our environment these days that also can impair mitochondrial function. In this particular video, I'm only going to discuss two that are very, very pervasive. Um, in an additional practitioner video uh, that, that will be sent out in an, in an email soon, I'm going to talk about fluoride. But today I'm going to talk about glyphosate and aluminum. So first and foremost, where, where is aluminum mostly found? Let's go aluminum first. Where is aluminum mostly found? Well, it's found in, it's pretty pervasive, unfortunately. It's been found in a lot of personal care products. Um, and so if you are like, be aware of what's in your deodorant, especially, it's also been used in a lot of different water treatment facilities uh, as what's called a flocculant. And so aluminum is essentially added to municipal water systems during water treatment and water processing because it takes suspended particles and binds to them and basically makes them heavier and pulls them down to the bottom. But it doesn't mean that the, that aluminum stays at the bottom oftentimes but what you'll find is that the amount of alum aluminum needed to clear the suspended particles actually is an overshooting of the amount of aluminum needed to do the actual clearing. So therefore, additional aluminum can remain in the drinking water. So it can be found in our drinking water, our personal care products. It can be found in things like our cookware. So there's definitely aluminum cookware, aluminum foil, and uh, aluminum can even be found in things like um, jet fuel. Uh, as well. So like, you know, aluminum is everywhere. It's very pervasive, unfortunately. And so what are the ramifications of this when it comes to what I was talking about, uh, about creating mitochondrial dysfunction and or cellular dysfunction that leads to these cytopathic effects that we see that then require things like fungi, bacteria, viruses, microorganisms to essentially come and clear up the debris or the damage. Um, and so what it does is uh, aluminum actually, in terms of how it looks, to look, so I'm just putting that in quotation marks. I'm going to keep it a little simple. In terms of how aluminum looks to the body, it looks very similar to magnesium, meaning aluminum can displace magnesium in the body. So where do we have a lot of magnesium? Well, intracellularly, we have a huge concentration of magnesium, or we're designed to have a huge concentration of magnesium inside of our cells. And that's because that magnesium is needed in so many different ways. Number one, it's estimated that that magnesium is needed for at least 300 different biochemical reactions to take place. So it's an enzyme cofactor to allow these reactions to be efficient. It's also used in the mitochondria itself in order to do things like produce um, acetyl-CoA, which is part of maintaining essentially the electron transport cycle, right? You have these cycles which are trying to create these electron donors to give to the mitochondria so that they can make water and ATP. And speaking of ATP, it's also um, been well established that magnesium is needed to bind to ATP for ATP to be effective in the body. So you'll never just find ATP by itself. It's an ATP magnesium. Well, I'm not gonna say that because I've never looked at every study on that, but I will say oftentimes you'll find a magnesium and ATP complex in order for ATP to do its work, which um, is essentially to bind to proteins and help proteins create their correct linear structure so that exclusions on water can form around them. And so there you go. Right? We've got a lot of things that we need magnesium for inside of the cell. And you can imagine what would happen if all of a sudden, instead of magnesium, we have aluminum that has been inside of the cell. Now, interestingly, aluminum is a heavy metal that has also been shown to diminish exclusion zone water levels. So Dr. Gerald Pollack's lab has assessed a lot of different substances for their ability to either enhance exclusion zone water levels, spoiler, spoiler alert, very interesting substances that have a long history in natural amounts, not necessarily excessive supplemental amounts, but natural amounts such as curcumin and, and um, holy basil tea or Tulsi tea, right? Those things have been shown to increase exclusion zone water or enhance the ability of something to build exclusion zones. However, there are things that have been shown to diminish 
the exclusion zones. Uh, and so that would be that would be things like heavy metals, such as aluminum, as well as glyphosate, which I'm also going to talk about in this video. So there you have a big issue, right? We have we have a specific metal that has the ability to get intracellular because it looks like magnesium and we have a high concentration of magnesium inside of the cell. And once it's inside of the cell, it then can go on to um, basically displace where magnesium is needed in all of these enzymatic pathways, um, in its ability to help ATP function, in its ability to help mit mitochondria function in terms of their electron processing. So it becomes a big issue. And remember, when mitochondria can't produce adequate amounts of water and ATP, mitochondrial dysfunction can ensue, and that leads to e even further reduction of exclusion zone water. So we have a cell essentially that's in a very uh, energy deprived state or excessive inflammatory state. And that excessive inflammation then means that the cell has to pack up the damage and kick it out to the exterior environment around the cell. And that's where then the, the quote unquote microorganism cleanup crew can come in and take it uh, and, and essentially process that to try to keep the tissues as healthy as possible. And so aluminum can, can definitely wreak havoc throughout the body, um, especially it especially has an affinity for the brain tissue, likely because the brain is just is really full of mitochondria, meaning you have a lot of ATP production that's being um, produced inside of the brain itself. Hence why we see aluminum as a um, potential um let's say we see aluminum implicated in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. So aluminum is one that I want you to pay attention to about where, how you're maybe being exposed to it. Because step one in any of this is to lower your exposure levels, right? Lower your exposure levels. At the end of this video, I'm going to talk about um, a means that I use to help clients excrete these toxins. However, step one would be to lower exposure levels. So find where aluminum might be that in your environment and what you can do about it from changing your cookware, your personal care products, filtering your water. And remember to get the aluminum out, we do need something like a reverse osmosis or distillation filter. Now, I don't recommend that it be the, the water that you drink. I love reverse osmosis for filtering out toxins, but at the same time, it strips the water of minerals and structure that are needed for our body to actually absorb the water we're drinking. So I've had many clients come to me, both in private, in my private one-on-ones and also in my community, who say things like, well, I drink a lot of water, but I feel like it runs right through me. I just feel extremely dehydrated. And it turns out that oftentimes this water is just reverse osmosis water without the minerals, without the structure. Um, and sometimes people need a lot of minerals in their water to start actually pulling it in um, and enhancing places where that dehydration needs to be supported, such as in the blood volume. Okay, so obviously aluminum can be a big issue, right? And can create that cytopathic effect. Here's something that's very interesting um, also as well, and that would be glyphosate. Glyphosate is another one that was assumed to have no role in the human body. Um, and unfortunately, it actually has a lot of pathological effects in the human body, even at low doses. Uh, it can change the gut microbiome um, in a way that harms their ability to produce what are called aromatic amino acids. And remember in previous videos and in a lot of my teachings, I talk a ton about how these ring shaped amino acids like tyrosine and tryptophan and phenylalanine, how we actually transform these ring shaped amino acids into, dip into our neurotransmitters using ultraviolet light as a catalyst, as a signal, as a stimulus. So you can imagine if we're not able to produce adequate amounts of tryptophan, to then eventually make the serotonin. And eventually that serotonin become, is designed to become melatonin in response to darkness. Well, then we're gonna probably have issues with having low mood and poor sleep at the same time. It's a vicious cycle. So that's, that's just in one of the things in the gut alone. But when it comes to mitochondria and cellular function, we do know that glyphosate actually also can significantly impair mitochondrial function by doing things like lowering the mitochondrial membrane potential, meaning that's a fancy way of saying it, it really harms the mitochondria's ability to make water and ATP and can lead to excessive reactive oxygen species. Now, remember, reactive oxygen species are not bad or good, and I like to view them instead as biophotons because that's really what they are. It's a light signal coming from the mitochondria, and the mitochondria are designed to signal with light, with light flashes, you know, biophoton signaling to the DNA, 
to the membrane, to the immune system, right? We, so we have natural biophoton release from the mitochondria. But when mitochondria become dysfunctional in their ability to uh, produce water and ATP, then instead of producing just a few reactive oxygen species, we're now producing massive, massive, massive amounts of reactive oxygen species or biophotons that um, can signal basically a cell that's in danger. This is a cell that draws the attention of the immune system. The cell goes into this uh, really impaired metabolic function, cell danger response, where it's trying to sequester calcium and clear things from the cell. And that's again, where we can get these toxins in the, from uh, creating this kind of cytopathic effect around the cell that can draw the attention of our cleanup crew. In addition to that, these days, we are surrounded by non-native EMFs. And so non-native EMFs by themselves are another way that we can really dysregulate mitochondrial function. And I want to classify that as a toxin as well, because non-native EMFs would be a form of wireless pollution that is pervasive these days. And it, has, it does have the ability to essentially force the mitochondria to start to um, sequester calcium and to, do, to clean up damage. So again, it, it prevents mitochondria from performing their beautiful task of making water and ATP. And Dr. Pollock's lab also showed that non-native EMFs, such as wireless radiation, diminish the ability of the body or of a, of a um, experiment, an experimental situation to actually form adequate exclusion zones in the first place. So you can imagine a very typical situation is where we've been exposed to glyphosate, non-native EMFs, and heavy metals such as aluminum. And then that allows then the body to, or that depending on where those toxins create the majority of their damage, that is what ultimately creates dysfunctional mitochondria. And then this cytopathic effect of the cell trying to purge stuff in order to try to reestablish healthy function. And then the cleanup crew shows up. So what can you do about glyphosate? That's a tricky one um, because uh, it's it's newer in our ability to understand how the body is processing it and how the body is eliminating it. Um, but one of the things that I like to uh, do with, with glyphosate in particular, I like, well, in all any persistent organic pollutants, I like to optimize the elimination via sweat. Now, here's a side note. When people are highly toxic inside of their cells, they have a very hard time sweating. Uh, likely they're just very exclusion zone water depleted. So there's the ability for toxins to really get inside of the cells and take hold and wreak havoc. Um, and so there, it can be a gradual process of getting clients to sweat again, meaning little tiny hits of, of sauna, right? Or movement, but not very few of my clients who are in the throes of a chronic healing journey um, have the ability to truly sweat, right? Uh, via movement and exercise. If you can sweat with exercise, that actually can be very, very healing and beneficial. Um, it's actually been shown to help to eliminate persistent organic pollutants, flame retardants, um, heavy metals, right? So we can do a lot of elimination via the sweat. And yes, you can also get that via sweating in a passive means such as sauna as well. So sauna therapy and sweating is a great means of helping the body to eliminate these toxins. Um, and then again, just being aware of our exposure. Now, anytime I'm doing something to try to eliminate toxins from my body, either whether it's a heavy, intense sweating exercise session or sauna session, I always like to pair that with um, th things like appropriate water consumption and electrolytes, right? I've got, I've got recommendations for things like that in my courses. Um, and also a, a binder afterwards. And one of my favorite binders is by a company called Supreme Nutrition called Takasumi a very gentle, meaning it really hasn't been shown to constipate. So it's a very gentle binder, yet highly, highly effective. So I like to make sure that that binder is on board so that as the body is trying to mobilize toxins and eliminate them via the different pathways, such as sweat, um, they're able to then bind them up if needed. Now, I do prefer sweat for glyphosate, if at all possible, because another thing that glyphosate does is it impairs an enzyme system in the body called the cytochrome P450 enzyme system. That's a fancy name for something called phase one liver detoxification. So as a toxin gets goes into the liver, it typically has to get processed two times. And then, then it becomes water soluble and can be eliminated via the sweat or the urine um, or 
uh, well, typically via the urine in that instance, or can be also bind to bile and be eliminated via the feces. So how do how does that take place? Well, um, or how can glyphosate impair that? Well, glyphosate can disrupt phase one, liver detoxification. So it prevents toxins from essentially going through the pathway into being able to be water soluble and get eliminated in the first place. So that's why I think we see a big bioaccumulation or we can see a big bioaccumulation of glyphosate in the body. Um, I haven't touched, I haven't talked about this yet in this video, but I do wanna to touch on the fact that if you have a connective tissue challenge, such as Ehlers-Danlos or hypermobility, or just feel connective tissue pain, stiffness, dehydration, um, oftentimes, I do believe that glyphosate is implicated in that as well, and that is because our connective tissue, our collagen, actually requires an amino acid called glycine in order to stay very, very um, healthy. So the health of the collagen is dependent on it forming these beautiful triple helix structures. So picture these winding staircases that kind of interlink together, and these winding staircases are surrounded by exclusion zone water. It turns out that glyphosate has the potential to displace glycine in the collagen and in any other place in the body where glycine is needed, um, such as certain, there's a lot of different enzyme systems where this can take place. And so all of a sudden now, instead of collagen being able to form this beautiful triple helix and be full of this really conductive water um, that helps the collagen to maintain its correct length tension relationship, now all of a sudden we have glyphosate standing in the way. And so that's why I think we're seeing changes in the length tension relationship leading to both hypermobility and also excessive stiffness and tightness and dehydration. Uh, I do believe glyphosate is, is at play there. Um, just my clinical observation. So yeah, so then I, I hope this gives you a little bit of an understanding that yes, we are bombarded by toxins. Step one, avoid, especially what you put, you put, you put on and in your body. So avoid at all costs those, those sorts of toxins. And then do your best to try to mobilize them out of your body via the sweat. We, we can have an out route via the bowel. So we're pooping regularly and out route via the urine. So we are drinking adequate amounts of, of clean, um, remineralized structured water. And over time, the body can do its thing in conjunction with building up all of the beautiful en uh, energy and charge we can get from things like sunlight on the skin and earthing and grounding. And this can go a long way towards um, dismantling the ability of these toxins to really take hold intracellularly and be negatively impactful and can really, really start to improve symptom burden. So hope this helps clarify that whole toxin question that I got last time and I'll see you next time.